Hi, this is Anthony Parent of Parent and Parent LLP IRS Medic, and today we have a repeal FATCA update. Uh, we have two reoccurring guests. We have John Richardson, and we also have Keith Redman, and a new guest today, that is Suzanne Herman. Suzanne, hello. How are you doing? I'm doing great. All right. Thank so you. we're going to have you. Hey, Keith. Hey, John. How are you doing, guys? Doing well. All right. Well. Very well, thanks. Great to hear you. All right, so Keith, what's going on? Give us a quick update of where we are right now. Well, good question. Where we are in re re relating to FATCA, um, I think the only th – this is one of the reasons why we're having this podcast. So there's movement on the U.S. side um, with a possibility of having an updated hearing. However, in tandem with movement on the U.S. side, there's also been movement on the European Union side in regards to pushback from the EU onto the United States as a result of the good works of the Association of Accidental Americans in France, who has been the driving force with the education and informing the uh, members of parliament on the EU level of the problems of FATCA. And the gentleman by the name of Fabien Lagra has been key in driving this um, in Europe, which is a good thing because it has to be done in tandem. But for today, I think we really need to talk about um, this uh, updated FATCA hearing and the continued damage and global discrimination that's being done to Americans overseas and uh, residents of other countries, tax residents of other countries. So my question is, is, is that we had a hearing last April, so is this next hearing a sure thing, or is it sort of up in the air? Well, I think it's, you know, it's a good question. I think it can be a sure thing if we get enough Americans overseas to write their uh, U.S. representatives um, and to, to ask them to support and sign on to this FATA hearing. Um, at present, and Suzanne's going to talk about this a little bit more, you know, we, at present we have uh, bipartisan support for uh, an updated FACTA hearing, whereas the last hearing we really didn't have that bipartisan support. So logic, if one can use that term, states that there's a good uh, possibility of having a updated FATCA hearing. But we've got, we got to make the effort to get our voices heard to have this hearing. That's right. And I think, you you know, um, this is where Suzanne comes in, because I've heard she's pretty instrumental. You know, she I know she won't take full credit for this. And there's other people who have been helpful. But I heard Suzanne was incredibly helpful on getting this hearing done. Now, Suzanne, you got you. <laughs> I don't know how much of your story you want to share with me about what your experience is, but you have been affected by FACA. Could you tell me the steps you took to sort of see its repeal? I am affected by FACA, but not to the extent that um, many people in Europe are feeling it. I live in Canada, and in Canada at this point, you know, bank, account, bank accounts aren't being closed. So I'm um, not affected that way. It's not so desperate in that respect. However, you know, my information is being passed to not only the U.S. government, but the Canadian government, and it's unprecedented, really. Um, you know, there's there's no reason to suspect me of any kind of nefarious things going on with my bank account. So why should the Canadian government have access to this information? Um, now, as far as repeal goes, uh, my congressman, I didn't really bring fact uh, to his attention. Mm -hmm. uh, congressman Posey has written uh, letters to current um, Secretary of the Treasury, and also the past one. His initial letter was written to Secretary Liu. And uh, at that point, I thought, well, this is great. You know, I just happen to have a congressman who um, does not support FACA, in fact, is, you know, has very uh, grave concerns about it. And uh, how easy would it be for me to sort of encourage him to take a greater effort to do something about it, actually. So this is what's kind of come to fruition here with this hearing that's um, on the wind, so to speak. But, uh, you know, it, it's going to take a lot more than just me uh, speaking to the, uh, you know, uh, converted at this point. 
Well, I guess I'm going to my next question is a follow up, a little bit more on the mechanics. Now, uh, Congressman Posey is from the eighth congressional district in Florida, and you just told me you lived yes. in Canada. So, how did you figure out that he was your congressman? Um, I'd actually voted once before. Okay. And you know, I figured out who everybody was. I voted during the um, when uh, when Obama was elected. Okay. Initially, as president, and uh, at that point, I sort of got a, a lay of the land. Um, I have voted in one uh, election since then. Mm-hmm. I believe it was just a midterm election. I didn't vote in the last presidential election. I couldn't couldn't make a choice. So, um, ev- but, so. Uh, so even though you live in Canada, there is you do have a U.S. you do have a U.S. representative. I do. Just like every expat, everybody does. Everybody does. That's and right. I think it's important to ask. Um, also, if I may add on to Anthony's question, is how is it that you're linked to Congressman Posey's district, and why did you decide that that is he is your congressman? What is the link to that? Well, district that was in Florida. Uh, my last address was in his district. Okay. Okay. Which is important for other Americans overseas to know, and it's the reason for the question to you. Right. Now, my husband is an accidental American, and he doesn't have a last address in the United States. And he, and he was told that he could basically um, vote from any district of his choice. But he hasn't chosen to do so because he considers himself an accidental American. In fact, my husband and I... Uh, you couldn't have better poster children for the difficulties that Americans abroad face when it comes to taxation and other things. Um, my husband was not born in the United States. He was made a U.S. citizen through his American father. He was born in Canada. And I left when I was 12. Now, since then, we've been through sort of rigorous uh, tax um uh, I hope the word be. You're gonna have to edit that out. <laughs> well, I think you, you you know you've been through the you've been through the first offshore voluntary disclosure initiative. So when I hear OVDI, I said, okay, that's a very old case. And I think the part of it that bothers me the most, because this is true of my clients too, is that the people who came forward the soonest got a worse deal yeah. than the people who came through later who were able to go through a streamlined. And so it's just right. completely obnoxious. Well, the, and there's no sort of apology or accountability from the IRS to say, oh, yeah, we were totally wrong on this and we really treated people unfairly because we changed the rules for the better for people who waited. Yeah, but, you know, but their attitude is, well, you should have been complying all along anyway, and you should be lucky yeah. that we're, you know, being more lenient. <laughs> on you, right? That's kind of their attitude. Yeah. You know, and, and I, you know, we... Well, the 2011 OVDI, people had it better than the 2009. And then um, we were able to transition into Streamline, but, you know, we'd already been through, yeah. you know, all the years of... Uh, eight years, eight years, right, tax yeah. ...the returns we had to do to be into in OVDI. And, but what's made things infinitely more worse, which makes me... I would say almost regret ever coming into compliance is the fact that now our Canadian corporation is being subjected to the transition tax yep. and guilty. Yep. So, as I said, we're poster children for whatever could go wrong for someone, for an American citizen living abroad. 80% of people, Americans living abroad, don't file U.S. taxes and they're not subjected to this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'll never be. Yep. That's right. Yeah. And I, I think, think what's that's important, Suzanne, is that, you know, you've been through the ringer. And as a result, you've reached out to your congressman and yes. have, you know, gotten to know his office, the people who work in his office. And at the same time, he has been against FATCA and has written um, mm-hmm. on this particular issue, because obviously there's a number of issues affecting Americans overseas. And as a result, this whole thing, you know, because of your tenaciousness has blossomed into the possibility of an updated fat hearing. And this is something that needs to go out far and wide to all Americans overseas. Yeah. They need well, to that's establish right. a relationship with their congressmen and congresswomen. You know, when I first started writing to my congressman, which is probably soon after uh, we went into OVDI, um, 
I was just kind of desperate. I was just putting those letters out there and following up with phone calls and just speaking from the heart, not getting too much technical into the tax and all that, just what all this stuff meant to me as a, you know, a human being, as an American, right? And uh, eventually what happened was I think they probably just got kind of tired <laughs> there you go. from me and, uh, and, and responded. And I first heard from uh, my congressman's legislative director, and uh, we started working on things with regards to FACA because at, at that point um, – that's when uh, Congressman Posey decided that he'd write a letter to Secretary Mnuchin. So that that was in the works. It took a while for that to happen. He eventually got a response he wasn't satisfied with and has since written another letter, which I believe he hasn't gotten a response from. So and after working with the legislative director for a while, I was um, basically referred to uh, his, uh, uh, what is it called, a senior policy advisor. And uh, we've been working with him, and Keith has been included in those communications. So, um, And then he came to us about uh, a month ago and, su- and suggested that we work towards uh, putting a hearing together. Uh, this letter that was sent to the, uh, is has been sent to members of Congress, hoping to get people, more congressmen, representatives to sign on to a letter that's going to uh, the House Ways and Means Committee for this FACA hearing. All right. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Well, Thanks for everything you're doing, and I'm sorry for everything that you haven't gone to. You know, I mean, the thing is, is unfortunately, you're not alone. There's other people who have been beaten up just in the same way that you have, and you, um, because you've raised your hand to say, yes, I want to be in compliance. And my advice to the IRS, if you want more people to be in compliance, don't make compliance so punitive. That's that's really what my advice would be. Hey, John, I have a question well, for you. People, oh, go ahead, Suzanne. Well, how many people are, are being completely turned off of having anything to do with complying when they hear that those are, only those are being who are compliant are the ones who are suffering? Yeah. Or I mean, being subjected it, to hardship and possible bankruptcy of their the corporations that they, small family-run corporations... Yeah that they run in other countries. That's right. It just does not make any sense. Doesn't make any and sense really at all. <sighs> and the whole, you know, the whole, you know, I was reviewing a return today for a couple who their total income together is $80,000 is their AGI. And each year return was about three quarters of an inch thick. And, wow. you know, what yeah. we have to charge these people for each return, because we had, we had, you mutual funds and we had foreign pensions and so we had some of the more, most complicated forms that go into a return and it just you know I'm just reviewing this and I'm just getting more and more angry as every page I turn and you know and their tax bill is was I think about their tax bill related to their foreign income was something like $70 and I'm just, you know, it's just, that's where I actually still am right now. I'm still reviewing that return. So I'm very, very angry right now uh, with the IRS. And uh, I think I'm angry with yeah. the lack of people who pay attention because I think if we asked, you know, most of the, the members of Congress, you know, about Form 3520A, Form 3520, any of these forms, really, they would have no clue as to what any of them mean and when they are supposed to be used. And so we're sort of out there in a vacuum saying, here's the law and this is how it's impacting real people. Will someone pay attention? And by the way, this isn't helping the U.S. Treasury. You're talking about hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars. This is not going to help raise any amount of substantial revenue. And the drain on resources, as John says before, the number one victim of FATCA is actually the IRS. And with that, John, I would say this. My question for you, John, is at this next hearing, I I hope to see you there. I think I will. What do you think we need to show Congress uh, that we didn't show in the first time? Or do you think it's just adding more human faces uh, to sort of demonstrate like we need something significant to change here? Well, uh, I mean, I think on one level it is just keeping up the pressure and adding more faces. But I I think that to the extent that the witnesses this time are, you know, people who 
have very tenuous ties to the United States who are tax residents of other countries, uh, like the accident, like Fabian's accidentals and that sort of thing, I think probably I need to be given prime billing because, you know, FATCA, at least in theory, if it has a purpose at all, which it probably doesn't, but if one were to make up a, pers- a purpose for FATCA, it would be to enforce what the United States would call citizenship taxation, but which in reality is simply the United States imposing worldwide taxation according to very specific rules on people who are tax residents of other countries. And in fact, not only does the U.S. impose taxation on tax residents of other countries, but as you know from looking at these returns, it's a completely different system that uh, deliberately punishes uh, anything that is not U.S. Uh, so that would be any foreign pension, non-U.S. mutual fund, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a way of, um, I think, essentially confiscating uh, assets that have nothing to do with the United States. Now, uh, people would say, well, you know, it's the same internal revenue code that applies right across the board. But that's like saying in 17th century France that the law and its majestic equality prohibits both the rich and the poor from sleeping on the park bench. The reality is that these punitive rules apply uh, only to people who are tax residents of other countries. And, you know, by way of just a couple of comparisons, so a homeland American who runs a small business corporation that's incorporated in the United States is in no way punitively affected by tax reform. Uh, Suzanne, who runs a small business corporation local to her that happens to be in Canada, uh, is at risk of having her life savings uh, completely confiscated. Uh, A homeland American who buys Templeton Mutual Fund in Buffalo, New York, has a treaty like normal capital property and dividends. You buy the same thing in Canada, even if it holds exactly the same securities. It's treated as a PFIC, and if one were to hold it for 20 years, uh, basically 100% of the gains would be taxed, or you know, I would say confiscated. So I think that to a large extent, uh, you know, this needs to be highlighted because I I, I see this now as, you know, really more uh, long run of a, you know, as a um, a diplomatic issue. I mean, the United States I really cannot do this. And at the moment, I think perhaps enough people don't really understand how this works. Second point that I think needs to come out of this. Uh, so Charles Reddick is apparently going to be the new IRS commissioner. In an earlier article he wrote, he specifically said that people who comply with the tax law should not be made to feel like they're chumps. Well, I mean, I think it's incredibly obvious that the Americans abroad who are in the minority who are attempting to comply with these laws are being uh, severely punished for this. In almost all cases, uh, the, uh, the, the the cost of compliance in every way uh, far exceeds, I think, for them at this point, the non-compliance. And it's so bad that, in fact, although they don't notice it, they don't realize it consciously when they're scared and they come into compliance, coming into compliance for most Americans abroad is actually the first step in having to renounce U.S. citizenship because there's no way to keep it up. You know, you were just talking about, you know, your person, the $80,000 a year, you know, with a three-quarters of an inch tax return, which obviously you're going to be charging, you know, thousands of dollars, uh, well, thousands of dollars, for completion, they'll never be able to uh, sustain that, so they're going to be out. So interestingly, where I think this is going long run is that the only people outside the United States who are going to be able to retain U.S. citizenship are those who join the silent majority and simply do not file U.S. tax returns. Bottom line, compliance with U.S. law means, well, you can't really be an American Non-compliance means you can retain American citizenship. That's how I see it going. And I think that that message needs to come through loud and clear, that in totality, the combination of fact of citizenship-based taxation is imposing severe disabilities and compliance on those who try to comply with these laws. That is so well said, John. 
Um, you know, and I, I didn't know that quote, but that is exactly right that, um, you know, people who have come clean, it's hard not to feel like a chump. It really isn't, unless you had to, because there's some situations where people just sort of have to, and they know they prefer not to. But the person who voluntarily did, you know, um, boy. Um, like Suzanne. <laughs> yeah. For example. I'd like to say I'd like to say that the United States would rather have taxpayers than citizens living outside their borders. Well, I would add to that. I actually would add to that that I think the United States probably would rather have taxpayers outside the country who they're in no way accountable to. One of the interesting things about this discussion is I, you know, read the blogs and the discussion board, is that there seems to be this assumption that somehow or other uh, taxation should be related to the, to the delivery of services. I don't think there's anything at all about the U.S. tax system that uh, assumes that somehow it's related to the delivery of services. It's simply a system that, you know, that uh, puts together a system of rules for people to fund the government, you know, for whatever purposes. Uh, and really, you know, I mean, look at it this way. I mean, my God, to the extent that you've got all these people who are taxed, residents of other countries, you know, Fabian's group in France and people like Suzanne in Canada and all around the world, you know, you've got these people actually funding the U.S. government. Uh, and they're, you know, they're uh, receiving uh, no services whatsoever. And adding on to the uh, previous discussion about voting, my understanding, although I'm not claiming to be any authority on this, is that there actually is a significant number of, uh, uh, of people who are technically Americans abroad who, in fact, don't have the right to vote at all because the voting is, uh, the rules for voting are sort of a state by state basis. So we've got this appalling, obscene situation where in a significant number of cases the United States is claiming the right to impose taxation on people where they never could have the right to vote anyway. Seems to me that it's sort of analogous to what may have been going on in the United States in the 1800s. Are you talking about taxation without representation? I'm talking about, uh, well, it, it would include that. Yeah. All right. So um, what are the steps? I guess this might be a question for Keith. What are the steps for someone who is so angry and is fired up about getting FACA repealed? What should they be doing right now? Well, I mean, you know, as you can tell by this um, really substantive, robust podcast, everything is linked. And FATCA is the reinforcement tool for impose, for the U.S. imposing its uh, worldwide taxation on tax residents of other countries. It truly is a global stop and frisk. And that raises the ire of, uh, you know, many Americans overseas. And I think with this um, really strong possibility of an updated FATCA hearing, each American overseas who hears this podcast needs to reach out to their congressman or congresswoman. And if they don't know who that person is, they can use the last state and district in which they lived or in which they voted and to go down that route. And they also need to tell their fellow Americans overseas to do the same thing. And what the ask is for these representatives is that they need to support the uh, FATCA hearing they need to um, sign on to the letter that has been sent to them via an internal system with the U.S. Congress called, uh, I'm using the term e-letter, electronic letter, where it goes out to every single congressman, congresswoman, and every single member of their staff. So they are all aware of this letter that is has already been signed by, by, in a bipartisan fashion. Um, and more signatures and more support needs to be garnered so that this hearing can come to fruition. So they need to contact their congressmen, congresswomen, and they need to have them support this hearing. That's the bottom line. And Suzanne, I don't know if you would, you know, you would like to add anything more. Well, if based Anthony, on your discussion. Anthony could, if uh, Anthony could post so people see what's been sent to these Congress people and their staff. Uh, that would be a little bit easier for people to kind of understand the process. 
So there was initially a letter sent out by three Congress people, um, Comstock, Bayer, and uh, Posey. Bayer being um, the former ambassador to to Switzerland, if, if, if everyone can recall. And he, at the time, uh, was ambassador there when FACA was first, uh, I guess, uh, brought out, or the IGAs were signed, and he was very concerned about it then. I think a lot of people thought that he sort of fell off the radar uh, when he went back to the U.S., And but he has since uh, run as congressman and uh, now has a seat. I can't remember which where he is, but uh, he is involved in this letter. So the letter was sent out to all the Congress people and their staff, and uh, there's a letter also included that they just have to add their um, signature to. I think that's that's um, how it went about. Is Absolutely. it, uh, Keith? Okay. Yes, you are correct. You are correct. Okay. So anyway, if they if they could get a visual on that, if you could post that somehow with your podcast, I don't know if you can or not. Um, so what I'll do, Suzanne, is I'll put a link in the description to this video uh, with your sure. with the letters uh, that have been published, so that people can see it. In addition, I'll I'll republish all the social media contacts for the relevant players, uh, so that people can show their okay. support uh, for the repeal of FACA online and, and show that you know um, congressmen do respond. They do respond to um, when people show concern, and I think that's what we're seeing here, um, that they do respond when there's enough interest, and the point we need to make is there's a lot of interest. Right. Absolutely, Anthony, and also I think another point to, to add on to what you said is they also respond when you have somebody like Suzanne who has consistently worked on developing a relationship with her congressman's office and the people in her office. It takes time, it takes effort, but the fruits of the labor are apparent. And it's so important that Americans overseas do this. That's right, absolutely. Well, with that, um, if you wanna get engaged, follow the link in the video, uh, share this on social media, get involved, and I mean, what do we think for timing on this, by the way? Um, well, do we have a the, deadline, Suzanne, the, don't we? Yes, it's, I believe, that the the uh, your representative needs to send the letter by August third, I think it is. All right, so we got a little bit. Oh, we got we got just about a week uh, to get this out. So yeah. we the next week or so, let's really try to drum up the interest, and then we'll see when the hearing is scheduled. I know I'll be there. Um, I hope to see Keith, Suzanne, John, and any of our viewers who who are really interested. Then we'll be there at the hearing uh, to try to get FATCA repealed. And with that, this is Anthony Parents of Parents and Parent LLP Iris Medic. Be sure to subscribe because every FACA update we have, we do like to get out to people. So as this progresses, is as we get closer to that hearing date, which I am pretty sure we're going to be, we'll probably have a few more updates about FACA and maybe some of the other issues related to international taxation. Thanks again for watching.